are representing uh, preliminary research that my colleague and I, uh, my colleague Kavita Center and I uh, conducted uh, to understand how digital tax payment systems function in low and medium income countries, specifically uh, how tax authorities use this digital tax payment systems to improve the quality of tax administration and to improve uh, other forms, other measures uh, of tax administration success. I will begin by giving a broader introduction into the landscape of tax administration in low and middle income countries. And then I will define what tax payments, uh, what we mean by digital tax payments in our context. Uh, after that, I will go through some barriers and limitations uh, affecting the use of digital tax payment systems for tax administration uh, in low and middle income countries. And then I, I will conclude with going through what we understand to be the preconditions for successful adoption of digital tax payment systems, uh, of, of digital tax payment systems in, in, uh, in Africa and lower and medium income countries in general. From there, the conversation will move to a discussion on uh, future research agenda, which would be useful for uh, other researchers who would like to carry this work forward, also useful for tax administrators, for practitioners, for policymakers, and so on. Uh, when we talk about what digital tax payment systems promise to do, uh, there's a lot of research, uh, there's a lot of work that has been published, uh, there's a lot of pushing of the narrative that uh, payment systems in particular are critical, of course, to tax administration, and that the, their digitization would unlock uh, significant uh, benefits for tax administrations, for tax policy in low and middle income countries. It starts by saying that, you know, digital tax payments would reduce administrative costs and inefficiencies, that it would reduce tax compliance costs for taxpayers and improve the quality of taxpayer services, that digital tax payments can limit the scope for corruption and collusion by limiting face-to-face -face contact between taxpayers and tax officials, and that therefore digital tax payments would have the benefit of increasing transparency and accountability of the tax administration, and that these four elements together will improve revenue performance. In reality, uh, despite the prevalence of digital tax payment technologies, despite their, uh, their despite the sense that they are inevitable, there are still major gaps in our understanding of the effects on public service delivery and on taxation specifically. Uh, we need to define what digital tax payments are. In Africa specifically, we need to understand, before understanding what digital tax payments are, we have to understand what the, the characteristics of tax administrations are. Tax administrations are often faced with manual processes. Uh, taxpayers are heavily cash dependent. And uh, because of this, they rely on a lot of face-to-face -face interactions. And in this, the understanding is that uh, there are entrenched incentives to create. The result is that taxpayers face high tax compliance costs and tax administrations face high administrative costs. Uh, there's limited data governance across the board. And of course, uh, nascent tech infrastructure, including broadband, internet, electricity, and the resultant uh, uh, or related issue of digital literacy. Now, none of this means that it's necessary to digitize you know, without uh, overwhelming framework, um, it just suggests that these are the realities that tax administrations face. These are the realities that taxpayers in low and middle income countries face. And our focus today in defining digital tax payments will be on person to government and business to government digital payments. And I'll tell you why. Person to government payments are worth $8 trillion globally, although in lower middle income countries, uh, only about $500 million accrued, but there's much room for growth. And we see this every day, every month, every year, there's major improvements, major investments that revenue authorities are making uh, into, into person to government and business to government payment capabilities. And we're also seeing positive signs in the increase in internet penetration, uh, over 106 new users in Africa per second, and which is a tenfold perhaps even more than a tenfold increase since 2000. 
Uh, we've seen the, the, the cliche story now is, of course, the ubiquity of mobile phones and mobile technology and the prevalence of payment services and fintech services across Africa. Uh, we've heard the success stories with Photowave, Paga, um, PESA, and dozens of other payment services, uh, fintech companies in Africa providing payment, payment uh, services to Africans. Our review, uh, again, is going to be focusing on this P2G and B2G payments, and specifically on e-filing, e-payments, and mobile money technologies, because these are the most prevalent uh, forms of electronic payment systems and digital payment systems that we've observed in Africa. And it's, uh, it's, an, it's becoming a massive, an increasingly massive digital landscape. Uh, so what exactly do we know about e-filing and e-payment systems? We know that they become standard fixtures of revenue authorities' integrated tax systems. There's almost no uh, enterprise-wide uh, tax information system that doesn't include an e-filing or e-payment module. And on top of that, we know many revenue authorities are investing in, in commercial e-payment solutions and, and, and filing solutions as well. Here you can see uh, this chart and you can see the diffusion of e-filing and e-payment services across LMICs. Uh, on the, in the green, you see that there are 28 countries that have at least an e-form or some sort of electronic information system or digital information system um, that includes, you know, uh, filing forms or payment forms. Uh, we see that uh, a small number have uh, at least an e-filing uh, module available for citizens and businesses and about 17 countries that have at least an e-filing and e-payment countries. And this number is uh, most definitely a lot higher today than 2017. We know, for example, in Kenya, which has one of the most advanced e-filing and e-payment modules, uh, introduced the iTax system in, uh, in, in, in 2012, 2013, and revenue increased from 2013 to 2015 by about 31.8%. After that, we know and we've observed uh, in IMF research that uh, the introduction of e-filing and, and e-payments improved VAT efficiency across Sub-Saharan Africa. But we know that the most salient effects of e-filing and e-payment systems have been on tax compliance and administrative burdens. And uh, I'm proud to say some of ICTD's research has led, has uh, improved our uh, understanding of the effect on tax compliance and administrative burden. In East White Team, my colleague Fabrizio Santoro and his co-colleagues and co-writers have found that after taxpayers registered for e-services, they were 60% less likely to file nil. And they declared more terminal rent income, and about 70% of taxpayers were more likely to make payments. In Tajikistan, uh, research from Oyemola uh, Kunobe showed that uh, the adoption of e filing reduced the frequency of bribes by 18% amongst taxpayer groups who were already more prone to evasion and had the resulting effect of reducing compliance costs by saving five hours each month of taxpayers' time. And this in total amounted to about 40% of the time that uh, they otherwise would have spent meeting, meeting tax, tax obligations. Uh, similarly, in uh, a, a tripartite study in Belarus, Costa Rica, and Kenya, uh, World Bank research found that e-filing and e-payments led to a reduced time for businesses to prepare and file their taxes. In Belarus, it reduced time by uh, 804 hours, in Costa Rica by 239 hours, and in Kenya by 230 hours. And similarly, in Uganda, uh, more IMF research found that small business owners' attitude about tax compliance changed positively after the Uganda Revenue Authority, URA, enabled e-filing and new payments in 2012. And similarly, a cross-country study uh, by Kochano House shows the average time to file and pay taxes reduced by 16% within three years of introducing e-filing and e-payments together. In the same period, uh, the average number of tax payments was reduced by about 39%, uh, suggesting that uh, the e-filing and e-payments had a significant effect on, uh, on, on, on tax compliance costs. Uh, and in Rwanda, more research found that the introduction of e-filing and e-payments together uh, reduced the time for businesses to prepare and filed their taxes from 119 hours in 2015 to 109 hours in 2016. These are what we know. This is some of the, the evidence that we've we found from other research uh, demonstrating that e-filing and e-payments, when introduced together especially, tend to have positive effects on tax compliance and administrative burdens. 
but of course we have to punctuate this positive story with with some of the other data that we have which we will get to in a uh, moving on from e-filing and e-payments uh, another type of critical type of technology that is often used to digitize tax payments or that is often an engine of digitization of tax payments as mobile money which of course is ubiquitous now across africa um, especially in a few countries like Kenya, Tanzania, and so on. Uh, so there's been astronomical growth, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, there are more mobile money accounts than traditional deposit bank accounts in many countries, pointing to the potential significant effect of mobile money for financial inclusion. And uh, it's spread beyond early adopters, which are the Kenyas, the Ugandas, and the Tanzanias, to frontier countries like Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, Togo, uh, and mobile penetration, of course, is deep in Africa, deeper than the internet, the internet itself, because more Africans are connected via their mobile phones uh, than via the internet. And 21% um, of African adults uh, have a mobile money account, and likely slightly more uh, in 2020, 2023. Uh, and as a result, we've seen that mobile money is, a, is found to be more accessible than web-based e-filing and e-payments and uh, a lot more accessible uh, than connectivity through traditional internet uh, than connectivity through through smartphones um, and ussd in this case is the is a key technology that's empowering mobile money payments um, the effects of mobile money on, on taxation and the effects of mobile money enabled tax payments on, on, on tax system outcomes is uh, is a lot less clear to us than the effect of e-filing and e-payments um, we also know a lot less uh, of the effects of mobile money on taxation than its effects on broader public services in general. And so there's a lot of room here for uh, more disaggregated analysis. Um, we know that mobile money is used for various uh, P2G and B2G payments, utilities, civil registration, driver's licenses, fines, but we don't have as much understanding uh, of the effects on tax payments, although we have a little bit more understanding of the effects on on broader government revenue generation. So across uh, uh, low, uh, uh, low and medium income countries studied, uh, we've seen that uh, up to 46 countries have enabled B2G or P2G mobile money payments for at least one government service. Um, and 29 of those countries enabled mobile money payments for taxes specifically. And we know this thanks from uh, Fisher's Energy in 2020. Uh, over 90% of digital payments via Kenya's e-citizen in 2020 were made using mobile money. So Kenya is, is unsurprisingly leading, leading the charge in the integration of uh, mobile money for government payments. We've also observed similar effects on taxation as e-filing and e-payments, although we know a bit less about mobile money. Uh, in Mauritius, after the introduction of mobile money payments for personal income taxes, the Mauritius Revenue Authority recorded a year-over-year -year increase of about 12% in filed tax returns and payments. We know this thanks to GSMA research. Um, in Guinea, uh, after enabling mobile money payments for vehicle, vehicle taxes, payments increased by 70%, and the number of vehicle licenses issued also increased by 65%. Um, and in Rwanda, uh, the M Declaration 2, which was a mobile money based uh, system for paying presumptive taxes, uh, led to some positive uh, impacts amongst those who uh, adopted it. Specifically, it reduced cost, uh, compliance costs for taxpayers and enabled them to pay anywhere across the country uh, uh, remotely rather than having to travel to a physical location and having to uh, uh, interact face to face with tax officials. Uh, the story here is 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 somewhat positive. Uh, again, uh, the story of mobile money and the story of e-filing and e-payments is somewhat positive because the truth is there is some positive. There are some positive signs, some positive data and evidence that suggests that once tax administrations implement a digital solution for payments and for filing, that it, it can have uh, broad impacts for taxpayers or at least certain segments of taxpayers. And it can have uh, broad impacts also on the efficiency of tax administration. But despite this, not only do we need to know a lot more about exactly what types of effects it has in different contexts, we also need to know a lot more about the barriers and limitations that tax administrations face 
when trying to adopt various types of digital tax payments, especially mobile money and, e- and, and, and e-filing any payments, uh, web-based e-filing any payments. Uh, so we'll start with the demand side constraints. Uh, we know in general that although these digital tax payments can be beneficial for those taxpayers that adopt the payments, that have the digital literacy to adopt the, system, the digital payment systems, or they have the, the resources uh, to adopt digital tax payments, that they are generally there's generally low rates of, of user acceptance across Africa and across lower and middle income countries. Uh, we found research that shows that there's typically slow uptake or lack of awareness, or in some cases, a lack of access to computers and the internet, uh, despite the slow increase, the slowly increasing access of all of these services and of these resources. We also found that payment services, uh, payment interfaces are usually not user friendly, which is doubly harmful in contexts where people already have low digital literacy. We know also that some of these technologies, payment technologies, can be very expensive for businesses that are not well established, especially for small and medium-sized businesses. And we know that this cost can be debilitating, especially for businesses that operate informally uh, without access to capital or expertise to migrate to digital solutions. We know, and we've observed thanks to ICT the research that 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 uptake can be very low, even in contexts where uh, the authorities made adoption, digital adoption, mandatory, as was the case in Iswatini. After they introduced the digital payment system and made it mandatory, only 41% of taxpayers took up digital payments, even up to one year after a mandatory order was instituted. Uh, many taxpayers simply missed payments or they continued with paper-based practices and faced whatever the penalties were for doing so. Uh, we've also found similar patterns in Rwanda and, uh, and in a few other countries. We've also seen even lower rates of acceptance among certain demographic groups, uh, especially female taxpayers and those who have less formal uh, education. We saw this specifically uh, in Rwanda, again, thanks to, thanks to research from my colleague uh, Fabrizio. We've also observed troublingly low trust in digital solutions. And of course, low trust in digital solutions is directly correlated with low uptake. And low trust can be very costly. It leads to higher transaction costs. It suppresses the penetration of the digital solution. And fundamentally, it hampers innovation because there's just less, there's less users, uh, fewer users, less uptake. So you're learning less about how effective or ineffective the technology is. In Tajikistan, we found that uh, not only was there low trust in digital solutions, but uh, tax officials had incentives to maintain face-to-face contact and therefore maintain their collusive networks with taxpayers, thereby hindering the success of the, digi- of the digital payment uh, uh, innovation in that context. And as a result of these, uh, these dynamics, digitization actually had a counterproductive effect. Tax inspections increased after the digital solutions introduced, and collusive networks persevered uh, despite the introduction of these digital tax payment systems. Uh, in Rwanda, we found that low trust in the government and in the, in, in, in the tax authority and in the effectiveness of, effectiveness of the digital solution affected uptake. Um, well, of course, we need a lot more research to understand the effect of trust on, on adoption of digital payment systems. Um, but we know from early evidence, we know from the literature that early investments in data governance, in privacy protection, and in cybersecurity mechanisms can improve perceptions of trust in digital solutions in general, and of course, in tax payment solutions specifically. But in this regard, uh, many uh, low and income countries and many sub-Saharan African countries and African countries in general have a long way to go. Of 107 countries that have enacted privacy laws, only 51 are in. Of the 107 countries that have enacted privacy laws, only 51 are in low middle income countries. And in those 51 countries, uh, enforcement and implementation are often uh, uh, afterthoughts and done uh, after the fact rather than in principle of the design of the systems. Uh, we've also and related to trust, we've also observed that taxpayers tend to have a preference for in-person interactions. 
even when they have access to a digital solution. And so there's often a pressure on revenue authorities to maintain in-person services, uh, even though this itself could limit the optic of the digital solution, because when people have the option between both, they tend to choose the in-person option. Um, and we've also seen that uh, another factor driving in-person interactions is not so much that there's a preference for in-person interactions, but that digital, digital options, digital alternatives are too complex um, and therefore inaccessible. Uh, the two final factors on the demand side are that, you know, not just that there's a there's a preference for in-person or that there's pressures to push people well, to, to prefer in-person interactions, but that cash is still uh, the trusted uh, form of, of, of doing business in many low medium income countries, and especially in Africa. In Nigeria, only 10 to 20% of tax payments are made through digital tax payment systems, despite the high penetration of commercial digital payment solutions. So the fidelity to cash is immense and reflects ingrained incentives and interests and in, 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 reflects uh, uh, the business environment, cultural environment in Africa. And uh, we've seen that taxpayers still prefer to pay with cash, even when the costs of paying with cash are greater. Um, and attempts to restrict cash access and use are typically not very successful. We've seen examples with India's monetization program, uh, in Nigeria, Uruguay, and Mexico, uh, there have been efforts to restrict cash access, and uh, effects have on, 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 on the uptake of digital solutions have been very, very modest. Specifically with mobile money, one related issue is that uh, uh, there are small transaction limits for mobile money transactions, and therefore, the, typically the only enterprises, the only taxpayers that can benefit from using mobile money are small to medium enterprises, Small to medium enterprises who typically have other significant barriers to uptake, like the cost of adoption, uh, like, in, like the, the, the fact that they might be operating in an informal environment, and leaves out medium to large enterprises who have the resources to uptake to, to, uh, to upgrade to digital solutions, uh, but can't do so, especially with mobile money because of smaller transaction limits. In Senegal and Cote d'Ivoire, for example, the limit is about 4,000 US dollars, and in uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, only about $500. Uh, so, mobile money solutions that are explicitly tailored for small enterprises and taxpayers uh, may not be that effective because these are the precise taxpayer group that are less likely to be compliant um, in, in the first place. Um, there are also high costs of adoption, um, which is a, a, a sort of the overarching theme that has provided a uh, understanding here of the demand side issues. Uh, it comes with uh, digital solutions come with new and enhanced costs for taxpayers and tax officials. And these costs are, of course, very prohibitive. And digital adopters therefore tend to be male, university educated, young, married, and urban. And if you're not in this group, uh, the costs are even greater, and adoption is even is that the, and, and adoption rates are even lower. Moving on from the demand side, uh, barriers and limitations. We also have to understand the infrastructural constraints. Uh, we know across Sub-Saharan Africa, across low income countries, uh, digital payment solutions suffer from low rates of interoperability and technical compatibility. Interoperability here refers to the ability of payment instruments to support many payment instruments or many other payment instruments or providers. Uh, so integration is necessary for payments because you need to be able to make payments from one type of payment provider uh, to another type. Uh, and uh, integration is therefore necessary, not just between the providers, but also between government and different modes of delivery. Uh, one of the reasons for, for poor interoperability is competition between different providers, as well as rigid legal or regulatory doctrines that prevent or, or, or limit the rate of integration that's possible, as well as inadequate and incompatible technical standards. The result is a lack of harmonization between different uh, person to government options. Uh, but we also have noticed poor integration between filing and pay payment platforms. Uh, in Iswatini, for example, after e-filing, after filing digitally, taxpayers then had to migrate to a different digital service to pay. And, and this lack of integration uh, affected 
uh, taxpayers' experience of the digital service and had uh, limited uh, results in effect on, on adoption rates. One of the overarching stories of technology and of digitization in Africa is that the underlying ICT infrastructure across NMICs and in Africa um, tends to be a bit weak and digital payments rely on an established uh, ICT infrastructure. And here we're talking about not just broadband and cellular, but also Wi-Fi, but also the affordability of phones, including smartphones, the availability and affordability of computers, and even things like uh, the supply of electricity. Uh, weak uh, ICT infrastructure has significant material effects for adoption of digital payments and adoption of digital solutions in general. Uh, when there are system failures or slow systems or interrupted services, uh, taxpayers tend to trust the digital solution less and therefore tend to trust that uh, that they need to be engaging with their government in a digital way or through a digital platform. Moving on from that, uh, there are, of course, still the political, regulatory, and institutional constraints that limit the adoption and performance of P2G and B2G digital tax payment systems. Uh, we've seen that whole of government coordination is often required to make government payment systems effective. We've also seen that such coordination is rare, which results in fragmentation and incoherence of policy, fragmentation and incoherence of the, of the technology solutions itself. Uh, but we've seen some positive changes, some positive efforts made in this regard, especially in Rwanda and Kenya. Uh, in both countries, uh, there's a centralized government-wide digital services, services platform to provide citizens with uh, digital services, including payments. So you go to a central platform to pay for your driver's license, to pay your taxes, uh, uh, to pay your marriage licenses, and other types of, uh, of services that you might need to, uh, to make payments for. Um, but we've also seen that even in this context, there are significant barriers that relate to uh, limited political will to doing this, uh, whole of government coordination, you know, thinking of government as a platform is expensive. And typically we're dealing in Africa in, in areas with uh, budget challenges. Um, but a lot more evidence is needed here to understand the, the concept of a whole government coordination, the concept of digital public goods, uh, the concept of, of, of government as a platform and how of, all of these different uh, uh, paradigms uh, can, uh, can, can affect the adoption of digital payment systems specifically and can improve tax, tax policy, uh, tax administration's uh, performance specifically. One of the core aspects of our work has been trying to explore what the preconditions are for successful adoption of digital payment systems and solutions in very difficult contexts, difficult political contexts, difficult uh, infrastructural contexts, and difficult uh, 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 technological contexts. Central to understanding how uh, or what makes digital solutions successful is the politics uh, of the environment where the solutions are being implemented. Uh, institutional commitment and political will are the bare minimums that are necessary for effective integration and interoperability and necessary for data sharing, which in the back end is critical for the success of digital solutions in general. Political will uh, also relates to the regulatory frameworks that govern how digital solutions are, imp are implemented, including how digital payment solutions are implemented. Uh, having the right legal and regulatory frameworks is necessary for the simplification of tax, of tax procedures, which enable digital payments, but also necessary for advancing newer technologies, including digital ID, digital signatures, digital encrypting, and data encryption, which might be necessary for more advanced forms of, 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 of integration with digital solutions. Also necessary uh, for the success uh, or for the adoption of digital solutions are investments in human capital, uh, investments to sensitize taxpayers uh, about the changes that are being made to the ways that they interact with the tax authority, especially in low digital literacy context. Uh, but also investments have to be made to upskill tax officials uh, who may you know, have bad feelings about the digital solutions or we may not be that familiar with them. Um, 
And we've seen already that those with more foundational, so taxpayers or with more foundational IT skills are more likely to use the financial payment systems. But also the tax officials, more foundational IT skills are more likely to support the implementation of digital solutions and digital payment systems. We've seen that the underlying payment system infrastructure is also necessary. Now, this goes into the bit of the technical aspects, uh, you know, adequate systems are needed for processing, clearing, and recording payments. Adequate systems are needed for data storage and management, for payment verification and validation, for the accessibility of APIs. And of course, uh, you know, having user-friendly payment portals, whether that's through a mobile money or an e-filing and e-payment module, is necessary to meet taxpayers where they're at. Uh, applying a human-centered approach to design is absolutely necessary. In Nigeria, we've seen this where uh, taxpayers were more likely to adopt the e-filing and e-payment systems when they found the software easy to use when the language of the software was their local language as opposed to just English. Um, and of course, other taxpayers found it in, in Nigeria, they found uh, the reliability and speed of the system to determine their willingness to use it. Uh, so fundamental payment system infrastructure is absolutely necessary. Looking forward and concluding there, um, you might have seen that there, there are, of course, many gaps in understanding of, our, of how payment systems work. Uh, we don't know too much about the exclusivity of digital payment systems. We know broadly that there are certain demographics that are excluded or that have a harder time adopting payment systems. Uh, women, uh, people with less ed less formal education, uh, a lot of a lot of demographics on the lower end of the income spectrum, small and medium sized businesses. Um, but we need to do a little bit more research to understand exactly how these groups are excluded and to quantify the effect this has on, on, on tax administration and tax compliance, on revenue generation, uh, and on trust in, in, in the tax authority itself. Uh, we also need to understand the technical limitations better. What are the effects that power outages or reconciliation and confirmation delays have on payment system function and on, on payment system adoption? Uh, we've also seen an explosion of third-party actors, especially third-party commercial actors providing payment services. Uh, agents, uh, companies like Remita, Maxcom, tax agents and intermediaries, uh, payment aggregators. But we don't really understand the effect that these third-party actors have on, on adoption of uh, digital solutions and on the performance of tax administration. Uh, we need to understand better the effects of the digital divide. We need to understand better uh, the effects of, of the, the relationship between digital tax payments and broader public financial management. How does the underlying uh, PFM structure in a country affect the performance of B2G and payment and B2G payment systems? Is it a centralized or decentralized PFM structure? Um, and of course, we need to understand better what the institutional and political underpinnings of successful implementation are. Are commercial solutions like those provided by Remita and Maxcom, are they better and more appropriate than government solutions? And in what context might they be more appropriate? Uh, and how entrenched, for example, are challenges to intergovernmental and horizontal co collaboration and third party data sharing? How much competition is there between different government agencies that should be sharing data or that maybe shouldn't be sharing data? Uh, how do these entrenched inter-institutional dynamics uh, affect third-party data sharing and therefore affect the ability of governments to use data from payment systems and from other digital solutions to improve uh, tax administration. Um, but perhaps most importantly, we need to understand system outcomes. Um, how do we map out what types of different tax admin functions should be improved by digital tax payment systems? Um, how do we understand the effects on tax compliance? enforcement auditing um, and I, I'm, I'm happy to say that uh, on all of these questions there's a lot of new research that has been that has been that has come out even in the last year and that uh, we're only going to understand better how these systems work and understand better how to use digital training systems and digital solutions in general uh, to improve to improve the quality of tax administration.